Our next speaker, Professor Giulio Sabatifuga, is part of the organizing committee of the Spin-Off Austria Conference. He is scientific director of the Research Center for Molecular Medicine of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He is also a member of the Scientific Council of the European Research Council, and he was one of the first people whose entire own genome was given open access to. What makes Giulio special is his ability to see things from many different perspectives. He engages in the art of thinking and he knows how to ask the right questions. Here in Vienna at his center, he even has a room called the Brain Lounge, where he regularly invites people from the scientific world and politics to brainstorm with him. Welcome, Giulio. It was a pleasure to working with you during the last couple of months. I think I can speak for the whole audience. We are very much looking forward to hearing what you will say about Spin of Austria and how you assess the current situation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Yasmin. This is uh, very flattering in many ways. I, um, I am really, really humbled by being the person that represents, in a way, um, the community of both um, the academic research community as well as the, the founders. So um, I'm fully aware of the, um, let's say, responsibility. And I, um, and I ask everybody to bear with me if I'm going to be both passionate and imprecise at times. Speaking after Herman, and, and Mark is, is an incredible uh, toll call, and I'll try to do my best. I will start by giving you a little bit of a background about um, to understand the context um, where we come from. I am the scientific director of a center called Center for Molecular Medicine, as just been told you, where this famous brain lounge is. And we are incredibly privileged of sitting in the center of one of the uh, largest and, and most active research medical campuses in the world the Medical University of Vienna in the Allgemeine Krankenhaus. That is an incredible place because there are really a lot of interesting things going on. And we have this little tower, I've shown you in the middle um, with the halo, um, where there are uh, in total 19 different uh, principal investigators, 10 are in intramural and nine are outside. And we have a lot of students and we do a lot of research and they are young mostly and there are 48 nations and we speak English. So we try to create a very international and very dynamic um, environment. And we are not telling people what to do. Um, we give them the medical environment, but then tell them do what we call free-minded basic life science research. So do um, the most interesting things you can think of. And we are sort of specialized in particular areas that are listed here. But most importantly, we are um, acting with the super cooperation mode. We are trying people uh, to tell people to bridge as much as possible between things. And, and that is biology with medicine, but also experiments with computations and so on and so forth. And ultimately we are a training institution um, and we are trying to pioneering what a lot of people are doing as well, which is try to make the, the precise and, and personal medicine of the future. And uh, uh, just to brag a little bit about the place, and it's not to, uh, because um, I, I get kudos for this, just because you need to understand um, where this, um, let's say, spin-off uh, potential comes from. We are fairly good, and you know, by uh, any standards. You know, Mark uh, was was mentioning DRC. We have many of those grants. Um, actually, the most uh, I think telling uh, indicator is that our papers on average are in journals of very high impact factor. In fact, we, the, all the institution we measured were one of the, of the best in this sense. So we are good and we are biomedical. Um, but what else? Of course, it's very, very important that we try to do things that are um, important for society, as we mentioned. And so we uh, have no problems collaborating with the industry at eye level without doing any contract research, but doing partnerships and then to spin off companies. And uh, this slide here gives you a little bit um, what I think is most valuable, which is this green line, is a very well-developed interface between, on the left, the type of thrust that we create, which is um, good research, but also the interface with the medical world and society, where we are trying to say, we know how far we are going, but then we are talking to experts the moment that we're entering, for example, um, clinical application or evaluation. 
And part of this effort is um, with the spin-offs. And we have here a fantastic partner in terms of the Medical University of Vienna. Without this would not be possible. And there's a lot of things that come out of this. You know, companies come out of this, um, but other um, kind of platforms that we have created. And we're very proud of this activity and everybody is sort of prepared to share. And so here, this slide, it just gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea of how important it is that our students, for example, are thriving on knowing that the diversity of thoughts and the diversity of personalities and backgrounds are important for the quality of the output. And to, um, here is principal investigator. He's now at the University of Vienna. You have mentioned sitting on a tree with our um, lab books, just the tree of knowledge and, 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 some, and some, let's say, uh, team building so jokes that we have in terms of how we can visualize um, our um, interface with society. We are creating a welcoming culture for all scientists. We are empowering them. We are, we, are, we, are, we are covering them with kindness and trust. I mean, that is very important. So we create an atmosphere where everybody feels uh, able to give um, her or his best um, to the institution. We contribute contribution. As, we, 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 we acknowledge and, and recognize contribution as much as possible. And we are creating, that is important, we are creating a culture in which translating results for the benefit of society is a must, is not an option. It, it is something that is part, let's say, of the DNA of the place. And so here is probably my, my most important slide, and that is, should be passionate. Why start a company? First, it is the only real way by which you can fulfill the translating uh, mission that an institute like ours has. It is, it is difficult to do it in, in any other ways. If you're interested in changing, having an impact on the lives um, of other people, that's what you need to do. It's also very important in order to scale up ideas that in the academic setting cannot quite thrive because there is a different access to funds and there is a different scale. There is a different level of professionalization of certain processes. That is very important for any scientist who wants to scale up things. The other many very important motivator is to create jobs, create opportunities and foster talent. You have all these fantastic people, but you need to give them a future and not each one of them is interested in becoming a professor and, each, and not everyone can become a professor or should become a professor. In fact, um, there are many that have the kind of talents that are perfect for becoming entrepreneur. What is incredibly important is that for any, any ambition person, um, the learning curve that you do and that you get if you're stepping beyond your academic setting and you enter into a world of entre entrepreneurial, uh, in the entrepreneurial world is that your learning curve is much, much steeper and prolongs from whatever you have arrived at, at the academic setting. So it's, it's a way to, to really get a fantastically interesting learning curve and, and, and leave the comfort of the academic walls, which as we know, in many ways is uh, self uh, reflective and, and, and too self complacent. But most importantly, almost like from a soul point of view, from a spirit point of view, is a declaration of faith in the future. You foster a dream of future wealth and health for a lot of people. And that act is very, very empowering because then suddenly you can tell people, this is what I would like to do. There is a mission, there is something that you can explain to a lot of people. And here um, is, a, is, a, is a picture that shows um, the old site founders, and, and, I, and I gave them a trumpet, and the trumpet sort of represented my way um, to endorse them with, with a wake-up sound um, for the rest of the world. Um, and probably most importantly, it is simply, besides create, you know, uh, let's say having children, uh, it's probably the most creative act you may, you may do ever in your life. Before you created a company, the company would not exist after it exists. And it exists even if it fails. And it exists full stop. And it, in, in, in fact, it often creates other uh, spin-off, other situations. A lot of people get trained, and I'm, and I'm, I'm too long. Where did this come from? When I was 25, I had the incredible luck of following Manuel Buslinger in Dave Goddard's lab at Genentech. So for a year, I was, you know, I was the youngest person at Genentech at that time. I was the only PhD student. And I enjoyed this incredible atmosphere of professionals working together in a much more cooperative way than I would have anticipated. I would have imagined everybody to be very secretive and not to help each other, but it was an incredible environment. And Diane Penica, for example, in the same lab, identified TNF and TNF receptor. These were incredible years, TPA was approved. I really am thankful for having been given this opportunity. 
and it made me um, try to imitate this. So in 2000, I created Celsum, and not alone, of course, with other um, scientists and with expert um, professionals, in fact, from the US. That company is now sold to GSK. It was an incredible experience. That was the one company where I actually moved into the company and five, five years I was responsible for the science. So I have the experience of actually doing it. And the other four that are listed here are not all the same companies, but are the ones that I participated as a founder are all still alive and all very interesting. And here you, 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 you see the teams are incredible. I mean, when I, when I assembled this picture, I was saying, how lucky can you be to really have these ultra smart people, the best of their generation, always um, being able to assemble this team. And, and that by itself is incredibly exciting. And here is a little a table is a bit busy. I try to analyze things. Uh, I think the only thing that I would like to point out here is in the center is that as was mentioned already uh, by Herman, um, it is important to recognize that non-Austrians in Austria and non-US born in the US and non-Irish born in Ireland are very likely to be a part of the founding team because they do have this drive and they do have this thirst and they do have this ambition. Um, another thing that I would like to say is that it's been very nice to see pharma recognize these efforts and partnering early. But a lot of great things come out of this. Out of these companies, um, I mentioned here just these, the 100 jobs are just a Vienna company, so forget Selzom, Selzom is, is bigger than that. So a lot of very, very interesting development curves of individuals that, that flourish as persons. A lot of cases where teams were built where the team was clearly much more than the sum of the individuals, but also a whole community of entrepreneurs. Here, um, some of us are around Jay Bradner at that time, just starting to be the head of research of Novartis. It was an exciting time um, to be there, and that community now exists um, without me, and it's a wonderful thing to say. Many of them, I hope, are online, and I wish them all the best. And this is not only a community of people that were associated with SEM, but this involves a lot of additional people that come from different walks of life. And that is what is very, very exciting. Um, among the other things that we created is a very interesting collection of, of cell lines, but also um, a technology that now is part with all sites that allows to do precision medicine in a functional way that we think is very, very important. But now I come to the sobering part. There were a lot of difficulties, right? And I, and I will focus on this, and I hope that some uh, politicians are listening or, or people in the, in the different ministries. Um, it is difficult um, to work in a society where everybody thinks that innovation is sort of a state affair, not something that you should be personally involved with. It means somebody else is innovating, right? I use a phone, I get a vaccine um, shot, but somebody else is responsible for this. We would like to have a society, as we will see later, where entrepreneurs and founders and investors and agents come from the people. People feel up to want to participate. It has to do with the school university system that needs to be able to teach or, or at least um, somehow inoculate the value and, and the importance of entrepreneurship. It is not as if it is in contrast with academic and intellectual values. It's not that it, because you're a loser, you become an entrepreneur. It's because you, are, you trust that you can do something important. That mentality needs to be um, sort of <laughs> propagated because it's not quite there yet in this country, in my mind. I don't want to offend anybody. I'm happy to be in Austria. With that caveat, I, I feel uh, free to criticize. Um, there is, I, you know, I don't, I, many of them are listening. So I have to pay attention to what you say. But I would like to say, usually they're obstructive. Sometimes they're passive. Academic institutions have no culture. They really, they see this because the ministry sometimes says it's in the license fine bound and they need to do it. But it's not part of the DNA. They don't understand this. They don't understand entrepreneurship. The majority of leaders in these academic institutions do not have an understanding of entrepreneurship, full stop. It's a fact. Um, there is no critical mass of venture capitalists that we know. There are not enough experienced CEOs or experienced personnel can be recycled. That is something that will change um, in the positive view of, of Mark Ferguson. We will, we will compete with Ireland in getting the best minds and, and the market will grow. And then there is not enough space. I mean, our four spin-off, um, that are the five, six spin-offs from, from the SEM all had to leave um, eventually um, the building. Of course, they had to leave the building. That was, that was part of the plan, but they didn't have fine space here on the, in the ninth district where we are. So there is not enough good space, and there the space 
doesn't have enough chemical hoods, you know, you can do, you cannot do drug discovery. So people have a good will, and I apologize for all my colleagues that put a lot of work in this, but it is not quite there. There's a lot of red tape. Okay, the other difficulties is um, there's not enough reward system for the investors. Um, we need to really do this. I mean, this has been lip service now from these two governments, three governments for a long time now. It ha there have to be tax incentives. It has to be so that if you want to invest in these startups, you do not have um, a lot of the um, sort of the same kind of tax situation as if you would be um, investing in something completely different. It's also very important that maybe we have created a system where the, where the employees or where the people working in the company have, have a way to be um, taxed more mildly um, about their stocks. And also we need to be able to create a different kind of culture so that the grant fundings uh, as loans um, are really making it an, an attractive on the balance sheet to investors. So that's something that needs to be changed. And there is a lot of red tape. Austrians love red tape. This is a meta niche uh, sort of 19th century heritage, red tape everywhere. Please get rid of the red tape. I came here with an Uber uh, driver. Uber gets stopped next um, in the beginning of the year. I know the reasons, but still for the, for the students and, and the people who are driving, that is a bad sign, which is red tape. Okay, what else can this country do? There are some ores, there are some here, I, I, I downloaded from Wikipedia um, where they are. In fact, there is some talk, there is some salt, notoriously that's Kamagut and so on and so forth. But what we really think this country has is a lot of mountains and a lot of brains. So what else should the company, the company, <laughs> the Austria company, what, what else should Austria do uh, then to try to uh, do more spin-off? And so here I paraphrase the famous saying that has to do with the fact that Austria in the, in the critical centuries um, of between Middle Age and Renaissance and early Baroque times was not too good at doing war, but was very good at marrying. So that was the saying, um, you Austria, other makes war, you should marry. And, you know, Bella Guerra, Ali in Latin, to Felix Austria Nube. And so we, we change this and say, to Felix Austria. So the single most famous saying on the destiny and identity of this country, founder, make companies. That is what, what our wish is. Very, very quickly, recommendations. Um, it, it should be, there should be very, point one, very simple and reasonable guidelines on the participation shares of and decision timeline of um, sort of academic institutions in startups. There is no guideline, it's a mess. People don't know about it. People look at you as a criminal because you want to have some stock when you make a company. This is horrible. And this is really something that is, that is now we're at a stage that every time I need to do something, I feel am I doing, am I trespassing some, something bad because, because all around me um, in the institution, there are some people that think that I'm sort of trying to do something that is not kosher. That is not okay, okay? In fact, it's the opposite. And we heard about um, Herman uh, telling us about there are some simple rules that you can make on conflict, conflict of interest. It's not rocket science. And if you love what you're doing, if you, most of us as smart people, we, we are not gonna uh, sort of enter a conflict if we can avoid it. So you shouldn't worry as just as much. Of course it can be clean. And then there are fantastic technology transfer officers in the universities, in the academy, in many places, but almost none of them has ever started a company. Please try to find technology transfer officers who actually have started companies or actually at least have worked in a company because all of these theoreticians and, 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 and sort of uh, desk uh, criminals uh, are, are not really um, what you need. You need people that understand what are the limiting factors and what are. And uh, please introduce, as was mentioned um, uh, by the Minister Fassman, in the, in use as key performance indicator for academic institution, the, 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 the generation, but the thriving of startups, because you know, generating is only half of the story. So you need to want the startup to succeed. And, and very briefly, um, I think that may be important that academic institutions start to have an ERC like proof of concept without having to go yet at the stage of being able to engage the European Innovation Council. There is also um, an, a, a, the necessity to be able to have um, sort of some, some uh, sort of uh, packages of funds that you can give to the startups. Um, very important, value the scientists as human beings. Some of our non-EU collaborators in, in the in the startups have to you know, provide criminal records that may be okay, but then they don't get the work. You know, they found companies, they come from Boston, they found great companies, but then they don't get their working permits renewed. This is happening. 
while we speak. So all the ministers who contributed these beautiful speeches wake up. Uh, they, it's, it's, it's a fact that you can be a fantastic um, US born scientist starting a company and then you don't get your contract renewed um, because, and, 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 and it's humiliating. Um, then do tax breaks for scientists. I mentioned this and make a real welcome culture. If you go to the Magistrata Thailand, you, you don't have to feel like a criminal just because you want to be in this country. And then there's a perfection paranoia. I'm not going to um, go into too much detail. For students and young people, this is what we really want to address with this conference. Spin off. Here is Matthias Brandt, who is our PhD student, who after his PhD started the company Proxygen. We congratulate him. Um, it's a fantastic way to valorize your thoughts. It is, is not only that you are creating um, the value associated with your ideas and you're protecting them, but you're also protecting from these ideas being abused by somebody else. So that is a very important concept that you don't, that you don't have a situation where you say, oh, I don't care, you know, I'm a cool guy, you know, I, you know, this is all capitalist, blah, blah, you know, for everybody can use my ideas. It's not true. It's being picked up by somebody else and then you're going to have to pay for this in a way that you don't um, approve. So it's not only a way to protect yourself, it's also a way to prevent abuse. It's also very important that you say, if I do this, I'm also able to reach out to society and change it in a way that you cannot be. It's nice to be your own boss. It's nice to choose your own leadership style early in your life. It's nice to choose the team that you wanna work with among uh, the smartest and nicest people that you meet. This is like a dream situation. You say, you, you, and you, why don't you come? You know, it's a fantastic experience. And I really know um, that people who do that enjoy it tremendously. We, talk, we spoke about the learning curve. It is beyond science and technology. It takes you and you learn things that are fantastic. And you create wealth for your family, for a lot of people, for the employees, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you're giving back to society. And I think that is very, very important. Very, a, a, a shout out. Um, for women entrepreneurs. We have too few of them, but those who are fantastic, the coolest of the coolest colleagues I have are the bioentrepreneuring, uh, the bioentrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneuring um, a sort of woman, um, Gaia Novarino and Miriam Untalas. They're shown here with, with uh, Gaia with two companies, Miriam with one fantastic company. I really would think that it is important that we don't leave it only to men to create companies because invariably they will be having um, a, a, a better and more interesting and more modern touch um, than some of um, the other things. And, and we spoke already about, and, and Herman spoke about Christoph Huber. Innovation is contagious. And that's the whole point of this conference, feel infected. And we was mentioned the fact that um, Uber Sahin got an ERC grant, meaning that the, the, person that are, the person that are saving the planet, and I exaggerate on purpose, are really the people that believe in the right kind of basic science. And so be open for innovation when you do this. And we need more entrepreneurs to save the planet. I would like to end by thanking a lot of people, particularly the people who believed in me and started the companies with me. Here we have Herman Hauser with the same uh, as PhD students enjoying the famous brain lounge that was mentioned by Jasmine, all the investors that did it, and a number of people that um, were critical in those um, last 20 years um, that we did this. Thank you very much. And I hope I didn't go um, over time. Julio, fantastic. Thank you very much for these insights. We have quite a few questions in the chat, but uh, Yasmin would like to start with a personal question to you. Uh, thank you for the keynote, Julio. You're making a strong point that you can be a scientist and an entrepreneur at the same time. You have industry experience. You have co-founded several spin-offs. How can you manage to be in business and in the academic world at the same time? What kind of time management do you personally have? Well, I think that my wife can, can tell you the reality <laughs> of this, uh, but um, it is, you know, this spin-off reality. The, the first one, I, I, I work night and day, and I work night and day because I was in the company to the point that my family was really suffering, and I knew that it was either the company or the family at one stage after five years of working night and day. But the truth is that then you can also try to participate by contributing your science, your wisdom, if you want the experience that goes with it. And that I do because it's such an incredible pleasure to see this reality coming up. The level of energy and the level of, um, let's say, intensity that is associated with the spin-offs is so energizing. It, it, it's, like, you know, it's like having been on stage uh, playing rock and roll once in your life. You miss the stage. You miss having the feedback from the audience. And this is what, how I get energized 
is talking to these incredible colleagues of mine that are now experiencing a completely different level of um, learning curve than the one that they had in the laboratory. So, Julia, in addition to this question, how can a career of a scientist actually look like then, according to your advice, who wants who has scientific and ambition and also wants to found a company? How to combine these both things? I think that you need to, thank you, this is a great question. I think you need to identify a champion or two champions or three champions. So those people that because of their stage and age and, 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 and psychological situation and, and capabilities are ready to make the jump and work full time. It has to be a full time engagement. But at the same time, you also are able to participate, to help. The first years are fundamental. You have the experience and so on and so forth. So it is feasible and it's important that academic institution create situation where founding companies is compatible with keeping your position as the PI in research. That is, and, and they learn, you know, people underestimate how much they learn. The, the PIs at SEM that have started companies are much more sophisticated in, on a number of very important managerial issues that they would never be as sophisticated if they did not have this experience. And a lot of people go back to academia, so that is another very important point. If you go back to academia, like I did, I was hired straight out of a biotech for this position. I bring a lot of know-how from industry that is not typically available in the academics world. Fantastic. Um, Jasper Thema is referring to some remarks from Bernard Weber and Thomas Ecker, and he says, totally agree, we should raise awareness among researchers that entrepreneurship is a wished-for outcome of research. We will not lose researchers by this, since a researcher will always stay a researcher in his and her mindset. What is your take on that, the awareness that entrepreneurship is a welcome outcome of research? I think it's I think it's a it's a it's a it's a beautiful um, way of looking at it. As, as I said, in, in in biomedicine, unless you are in trying to get involved with what is actually happening with your findings, so that they can mature to the stage that they can reach the patient, is really not going to happen. So everybody who tells you a different story is is not looking straight into reality. So it's almost like the only way to be entirely honest is to say, if you're serious about it, if you really think you found a new good antibody, if you find a new assay, if you find a new target, then please put your money where your mouth is and try to do it yourself. If you don't do that, um, you will always live with the, I was a nice, very abstract academic person. I contributed, I trained people, but I never really tried to have an impact in society. Mm, great. There was also a discussion going on um, about interdisciplinary teams, how tech geniuses can work together with business guys and vice versa, how to combine these things. What's your take on that? I love that question. I mean, that is the magic of a startup. The magic of the startup that you find that some scientists are incredibly gifted in other talents that are not used in academia as much, such as the psychology of building a team, such as also financing geniuses, you know, people that have good business instincts. Some of them may have it from um, their family, some of them have it instinctively. So it's wonderful to see this, um, if you want, this cross-fertilization of talents um, that occur between, and you know, acad people, you know, academic people are pretty smart people. And so they can recognize other smart people and, and that creates a positive feedback loop on the quality of the economical analysis, of the commercial analysis. So it's it, to see these teams of, of people from different walks of life coming together, and we need more women because, because they still have a different view many times on, on how to um, tackle problems. When you have that um, team assembled, it's wonderful, and it has to be heterogeneous, and it has to be multidisciplinary. Great. There was also a discussion going on about uh, tech transfer offices. Ingrid started it um, and said, in my experience, the main problem with IP arrangements is that tech transfer offices are scared of undervaluing technologies and being slapped on their wrist by the Rechnungshof. Equity stakes minimize the risk. And then um, she moves on to say the term, uh, the key term is TTOs are scared, uh, rather that was a comment, does not matter if equity, or, uh, does not matter if equity or license. Irene uh, then also mentioned it is, the pro it is the people who make the difference, so how can we support the TTO people not to be scared? So what's your take on, on, on TTOs being scared and how can we support them on not being scared? I think Ingrid has a great point. I think that in, in, in many situations, um, if you say no, you're on the safe side because, you know, you don't take risks. And, and creating a company is the opposite. Creating a company is to create a very risky kind of situation. 
anybody who says something different is, doesn't think uh, properly. It's very risky. And so everybody needs to have incentives to actually take risks and the rational sort or whoever the um, any sort of accounting situation where you're, you're looking or auditing situation needs to understand that it is a responsibility to take this risk and it's not a responsibility to sit on an innovation and be obstructive for the innovation. So it's almost like um, it's almost like you need. It's almost like a, a personal value that needs to be um, looked at, which is: Are you sincerely trying to innovate in society and give back to society what you have privilege um, as being a sort of an educated person to give back? And that is what we need to um, take the fear of for off. Fantastic, um, uh, Julia. Time is up. I have a quick, quick question from Irene Fielka. How do you think we can copy the CMM culture to the other academic institutions? Do you have some quick advice on that? Well, I mean, there are many institutions. I mean, we are part of the consortium of, of 14 AU life institutions all over Europe, and we are learning from each other. And it's a fantastic situation. So that is a way by which we are trying to um, an analyze the process of why we are good at what we are doing, and, and, and we are learning from the best, and we are teaching the best. We are learning. I think that we are very we are very open and generous. To everybody who wants to come and learn from us, we don't pretend to have figured it out. We are we, the only thing that we do is we know that we we are on a steep learning curve. And, and we know that, that everybody who thinks they have figured it out and, and they're cool are not really cool. And, and one way is really to create these budding uh, realities that are the spin-offs and startups. And many people from here will go and start other um, institutions, having, having learned the kindness and the support that they experienced here. Julio, thank you so much for all your insights and your time. Thank you for being with us and goodbye.